Now, sometimes we have a guest on the show and I have to explain who they are or why we're talking to them. But this is a man who needs no introduction, partly because I listed all the things he'd ever done that would take up the entire amount of time we've got to, to have a chat. So I will, shall merely say I'm joined by Giles Bandrith. Giles, welcome to Times Radio. Can I say it's good to be back on Times Radio? I love yes. Times Radio. I love you, Matt. The last time we met, I think, was it the Cheltenham Literature Festival? It was at the Cheltenham Literature Festival. And you were about to go on stage and, and to a, in front of a delighted audience. Well, I went on stage anyway. There were a lot of people there. <laughs> And um, I would love you to tell my wife what I do, because she keeps saying, what are you doing? What are you doing now? Matt Chorley, Times Radio, on a day like this, weather like this, is this madness? <laughs> is anyone listening? You know? Yes, of course. It's too, it's too, everyone's staying indoors in the, or in air-conditioned cars and listening. That's of course what they are. So, just, but we'll come on to the many, many projects and things that you've got on the go at the moment. But uh, let's go. What, what did you, as a child, as a young boy, a young Giles Bandrith, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be, when I was very small, my mother wanted to put me on the stage. But I wanted, from even an early age, I wanted to be Prime Minister. And there will be people listening to this who rather wish that I was Prime Minister. <laughs> As you know, I did give it a go. Back in the 1990s, I was a Member of Parliament for five years. Yes. Uh, as, as we say, those of us who have been rejected, I was a Member of Parliament until the people spoke <laughs> and then we say something rather rude about the people. But it was a fascinating time. So when I was a child, I think I was full of uh, ambition. I had lovely parents who, uh, I think, made me feel that I was the most special person in the world, and which was lovely, which is lovely. But it gives you a sense of entitlement that's quite dangerous, I discovered as the years went by. And I've been thinking about this only because during lockdown, I wrote a, a childhood memoir which comes out in, which is just out in paperback. And uh, it made me think about my family and my parents in a way I'd never done before, because my, my view of life was look up, look out. I'd written a biography of the Duke of Edinburgh, Philip the Final Portrait, and his line was, don't talk about yourself, nobody's interested. Uh, you know, look up, look out, that's the world out there. Don't be introspective. And I I'm quite sympathetic to that. So when I sat down to write this childhood memoir, I thought it would be quite fun, you know, a trip down memory lane. And it was fun at times, but quite a lot of it was, was a bit difficult. And one of the things I, I, I realised that was my parents loving me so much and thinking and telling me I could do everything and anything, that I believed it. I mean, the first time I went for a swimming lesson and stepped out onto the water, to find that I sank was quite a shock to my system. I, 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 mean, I genuinely <laughs> thought probably I could walk on water. Um, and my mother saw me as a kind of future Fred Astaire. Uh, and, of course, I've got feet like Fred Flintstone. I've been asked to be on Strictly, <laughs> but I've said no, uh, because I know it would just be an embarrassment. Who wants to be out on week one? Too humiliating. Um, so I realised quite quickly as the years went by that I couldn't do everything or anything, but I've enjoyed trying to do lots of different things. And that's because I was sent away to a boarding school when I was seven or eight or nine, and I thought... At the time, briefly, I thought, oh, don't my parents like me? Why are they sending me to boarding school? I've since discovered from my sisters, I have three older sisters, that the reason I was sent away to boarding school was my parents couldn't stand the fact I wouldn't stop talking. And the family got together. My sisters said to my parents, look, we will chip in our pocket money to help pay for the school fees. We've got to have some peace around the place. So I was sent away to this boarding school in Kent. There was a marvellous headmaster called Mr Stocks. And when I was eight or nine, Mr. Stock said to me, Brandreth, remember, busy people are happy people. Five words. Busy people are happy people. And I think those five words that I was introduced to all those years ago by that head teacher have been, uh, well, the, the reason that I've led the, the sort of life I have led, being a busy person. I, my wife would say, busy fool. I say, busy people are happy people. So that's why I do lots <laughs> of different things. And the advantage of that was... During lockdown, for example, when certain doors closed, uh, there were other doors that I could push open. So I, I wrote these, the book, the, the childhood memoir, Odd Boy Out, and I finished my biography of Prince Philip during lockdown because the stage show I was due to do then, I was about to open a stage show with Judy Dench that actually opens this Sunday, uh, on this very Sunday, the, uh, and runs on till the 3rd of July, but it's all sold out, so I don't know really why I'm mentioning it, except 
I was going to do it two years ago. <laughs> just, to, just to tease, just, just to tease, tease listeners and it, and, who can't and come. It's and it's a show where we explore her extraordinary story. Her, it's called I Remember It Well, and it's talking to her about her life. But we are going to do that two years ago. That was put on hold. My own tour was put on hold. Um, television could only be done by Zoom, etc. Uh, but I was lucky enough, because I write books, to be able to do that. So I like doing lots of different things, is the answer. Is there anything that you've tried to do which you thought you'd be really good at and were disappointed to find that you either didn't like or, or, or weren't particularly good at? I don't think I've ever not liked anything because I think um, I'm lucky enough to be brought up with a positive approach, give everything a go. I've not succeeded yeah. in certain things. Um, I, I mean, as a member of parliament, I was only there for five years. The people spoke, they got rid of me. Um, my, my, my line, I sometimes say, is at the end of five years, I knew I had contempt for my constituents, but it came as a bit of a shock to the system to find the feeling was entirely mutual. Uh, <laughs> the truth is, I didn't have contempt for my constituents, and I do still go back to my old constituency, which is Chester, the city of Chester, because I'm the chancellor of the university there. Um, but I didn't pursue my political career because I didn't want to be in opposition. And one of the things I discovered when I was in Parliament is that government is the thing. That's that's what's interesting, that's what's exciting, that's what's rewarding. And I knew my lot would be out for quite a while, so I didn't go back there. So that, in a sense, it was fascinating while I did it. I really loved doing it, but it came to an end. I don't think I'm any good as a businessman. I, I've had various... Bu I mean, the, the reason I'm comfortably off is that I like work. I'm a busy bee, in the sense I, I keep working. Uh, I say... I keep working because I need the money, because I've got three children and I've discovered over the years that money is the one thing keeping me in touch with them. But but the truth is, I keep working because I've found, as Noel Card once said, that work is more fun than fun, on the whole. And most of the things I do are fun, even though they're work. You know, I do a bit of radio, yeah. a bit of television, I write a book. Um, these are fun things to do. Um, I mean, it can't, it's not like real work. What you and I do, Matt, isn't work. It really is. No, exactly it, it, right. Exactly. And I, yeah, whenever anyone's sort of complaining, oh, you know, I'm tired. So we're not, we're not down the mines no. here. We are having, you know, it's, it could be long and tiring and all that, but it's fun. And people, you know, we're bringing joy to people, hopefully, at least any, anyway, at least attempting it's a, to. It's a and what about... And so, because we keep coming, we keep drifting back to this period with new MP. 30 years ago this year, you became Gosh. an MP. 25 years ago this year, <laughs> you ceased to be. And it wasn't oh, entirely it, your no, fault. No, you're right. Let's, Let's blame my wife. My wife put our house in the constituency up for sale during the election campaign. I mean, that did not help. <laughs> on every other house and street, it said, vote Brandreth, vote Brandreth, vote Brandreth. On our house, it said, for sale. Now, the truth is, I was swept out on the tide. Yes, in the 1997. I don't think whatever you did to the good people of Chester, yeah. I suspect that the, the, the political times uh, may have played and a part. And it's worth it well. remembering that, for example, in my part of the world, the North West, I was a, a whip, a government whip, which is the most fascinating thing to be. And I know you very kindly have, have read my diary of my time in the whip's office called Breaking the Code. Uh, it was fascinating. But I looked at the swing in that part of the world. And one of my fellow MPs from up there was a man called David Hunt, who is now Lord Hunt of the Wirral, who is one of the wisest and nicest guys in politics, a really shrewd operator, an excellent cabinet minister, and a really good person. Uh, the swing against him was exactly the same as the swing against somebody else in that part of the world, who I won't name, they're no longer alive, but who had drink problems, marital problems, financial problems, and could not keep their eye on the ball, let alone on the problems of their constituents. It seemed to make no difference that this fairly nice, was well-meaning MP, who has really passed it and is now passed on, uh, got as much a swing against him as this superb MP yeah. in David Hunt. So there is no justice. I think they say that maybe it's a thousand or two votes in it is the personal vote. But if it's the tide is against you, the tide is against you. And I just wonder, because being a, an observer of this from the inside, um, you know, back then you, the, the prime minister had taken over from a, a female conservative prime minister. There were then lots of arguments about Europe, uh, mired in sleaze uh, uh, after a long period in government. I wonder if you can see any similarities to what's going on in politics None whatsoever. Today. Uh, because the example you give <laughs> is that it was John Major who took over from the female prime minister. 
and when life was fraught and there was indeed a terrible recession looming. And he then won the general yes. election. But of course, I know, I mean, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, yes. And in a way, uh, of course, you know, uh, what is interesting is that there is a kind of cycle in politics and the ups and... I mean, if you are, as I am, fascinated by it and have been ever since I was a little boy. I mean, I, 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 mean, I remember... 1957. I remember the Suez Crisis. I remember the resignation of Anthony Eden. Um, I remember vividly the Profumo affair, uh, partly because my dad, and my my book, in a sense, is a book about my odd boy out. This is given Father's Day is on Sunday, thinking about my dad. My my dad, among many other things, one of his he was a solicitor, and one of the people he was looking after um, was John Profumo. And John Profumo was a uh, Jack Profumo, the, ma the man who caused the Profumo crisis that uh, in some people think, yeah. say, you know, well, it certainly contributed to the downfall of the Macmillan government in 1963. So all that is very vivid to me. But I think one of the things that being older gives you is uh, a sense of perspective and that everybody is human, even the present politicians. I'm, I'm really thinking of my... My father, who was a successful solicitor, but I now realise, and I hadn't realised it before, had money worries all his life. Not because, I mean, he was middle class and uh, had a good income, and yet spent slightly more each year than he was bringing in. Not a large amount. He wasn't extravagant. He smoked a great deal, which is why he died at the age of only 71. Um, but he spent a little bit too much money each year. And my abiding picture of him, and I often think of him, now, when I go to sleep, sitting uh, just... Because when I went to bed as a boy, I remember walking past the kitchen and seeing him sitting at the kitchen table with a mug of tea, smoking his cigarettes, with around him all the bills. And I now realise, which I didn't think I realised as a child, that he was trying to work out which bills to pay first. He was organising, trying to keep on top of his finances. And so I have such sympathy for people who have money worries. And I also... Uh, I, I, well, actually, I have sympathy with everybody because everybody has worries of one sort or uh, another in their life, um, except possibly for me, because <laughs> I seem to be very blessed <laughs> in so many ways. And just on the, 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 the current political state, when the Boris Johnson, I can't remember what, what, what the particular issue was, but a few months ago, he rallied oh, Tory yeah. MPs round to try and bring them together, boost morale, and who does he turn to to cheer up the troops? The... The, the, the force's sweetheart, Giles Brown, just comes and does a turn, and you were the one who that got a start. It was a memorable motion. night, actually. And I, I learned something very interesting that evening. Yeah, you're right. To, to remind listeners who, who don't follow the small print on this, uh, a couple of months ago, the Prime Minister decided to have a, uh, a dinner in Westminster for all his government and all the MPs, and they're looking for an after-dinner speaker, and um, it fell to me to fulfil that role. And it was good, because I've seen a lot of old friends again. Uh, but what was very intriguing to me was to realise the problem that the government has had, and indeed the Labour Party has had for the last two years. MPs weren't there, and uh, they were literally working from home. They're, they were debating on Zoom, they were voting remotely. Now, if you read my diaries, if you've been a Member of Parliament, you will know that in, when times are normal, the MPs are there all the time. And in my day, they were there really all the time. I was there when they still had all-night sittings. And as a whip, I'd be there at eight in the morning and there still at midnight. I lived it. It was a village in which you lived. And you gathered around the watering holes, the tea room, the restaurants, the bars, and you knew one another. And you understood one another. And you knew where each other was coming from. And if you had a problem with any member of the government as a backbencher, all you had to do was wait till the voting, and everyone went through the lobbies, and every vote takes 20 minutes or so, and you're in the lobby. You can go up. Any member of parliament can speak to any member of the government. If you don't like what Priti Patel is doing, you go up privately to her, and you say in the lobby, look, this isn't going to work. I don't think this is why. Now, what happened for two years is the new intake from 2019, they didn't meet the ministers, and the ministers didn't meet the troops. And I discovered on that evening, my God, these are people who I like, and who should be liking one another, and would be liking one another, but many of them literally don't know one another. And there were MPs that night were saying yeah. to me, oh, who's that over there? I think I know him, I've seen him, and they didn't know one another. And actually the Labour Party will have had the same problem. Of, and and the, if, if Keir Starmer has faced challenges with people not really understanding what he's about or what he's trying to do, and his troops, it's exactly the same thing. So I am extremely sympathetic to 
to politicians. And this working from home thing um, uh, just doesn't work uh, if you want to make uh, cabinet government and parliamentary government really work. The whole strength of our system and it is uniquely strong, is that you have constituency MPs who really do understand what's happening in their patch. All the parties are good at this. All the MPs I know do surgeries. They do actually meet the people. They know what's going on the ground. And then they can yeah. relay that to the government. And that has not been happening properly. So it's interesting. It sounds like you think beyond, because people sort of say socially they don't know each other. But actually, your point is that, that, that almost the... The job of government, the quality of decisions, the quality of policies will have been Absolutely. affected by not it's having those all, checks and balances. It's much more subtle than people realise. It's not, I mean, it's not somebody sort of sitting yeah. around thinking, I'm going to do this, we're going to solve this problem this way. It's actually people uh, influencing one another, literally by, by the mood, the tone of the voice, the raised eyebrow. It's, it's that way of understanding people. And that's why I love being in the whip's office. The caricature is, you know, that you, if they're not voting your way, you lock them in the lavatory so they can't vote at all. Or you, you know, say you'll never get your knighthood if you don't vote with us. Well, I mean, that is that is crude and a caricature. What you have to do... Is, well, it, it's not is untrue. it completely it's not untrue? untrue? I mean, in the sense... No, no, it's not untrue. It'd be disappointing if, um, you know, you and your wife aren't going to the Royal Garden Party this year. Uh, that sort of uh, thing has gone on in the past. Yeah. But it's but the whole thing is really a matter of truly understanding what the person is about. Because if somebody, for example, if a backbench member of parliament has a drink problem or a financial problem or a relationship problem, that will impact on their thinking. And a sympathetic, an un, a thoughtful whip will understand that and will know what's going on. It's the That's what I loved about politics. It's a people business. And um, it's it's very difficult now. I mean, things that have changed in my day, not only Parliament sits for fewer hours, you're not so close, but the 24-hour news cycle has now become uh, truly oppressive. And any uh, divergence from the line, the party line, is um, jumped on. You're, it's, oh, 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 rebel, rebel. Uh, and yet, on the other side, if everyone sends out the same tweet, oh, I see, they've all been given the toe of the party line. You cannot win. Um, so it's, I, I'm very sympathetic to politicians, and I think we're jolly lucky. I say this, I've got a daughter, um, Afra. Uh, I, have, I have two daughters and a son, and they're all incredibly brilliant people because we know who their mother is. Of that, we can be certain. And my daughter, Afra, uh, it has been a parliamentary candidate. She stood at the last general election in a really hopeless seat against the leader of the Lib Dems, um, but is uh, you know uh, up for being a candidate again and has been a local politician and is a, a shrewd cookie. And I think to myself, my God, we need people of my daughter's generation, um, young, intelligent women like her to, do it. to do it. Uh, yeah. And we mustn't make it such a grim life that none of them want to do it. If you'd been, if you had still been there in the in the that big committee room, the oak panels uh, committee room uh, last week, would you have voted the? Uh, I am in Boris Johnson? always have been a team player. I mean, I, that, I just know that that's the way to win things. Yeah. Uh, not just in politics, but in in life. Um, sometimes I, 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 well, I've written a book about the Duke of Edinburgh, the late Duke of Edinburgh, and who was uh, completely above really up, way above party politics. It didn't interest him at all or appeal to him. Um, but he was very into sport and games and the value of, uh, of team play. And I learnt from him that unless you play as a team, your team will not win. And uh, the truth is, um, you've got to play as a team and you've got to back the captain. So that would always be my instinct, come what may. And I'm somebody who has been, you know, was involved as a conservative when Sir Alec Doug I first stood as a school candidate. My wife says, "No development in your life, Charles. None whatsoever. You were stand at school when Sir Alec Douglas Hume was prime. Alec Douglas Hume, you stood up <laughs> with a little blue rosette on. Bless your heart, you backed Sir Alec Douglas Hume, uh, and you know then you black backed Ted Heath. I mean, what was all that about? Then you backed Margaret Thatcher. I mean, make up your mind, man." Uh, and, I, and I did make up my mind each time. I, I was going to, as it were, have a, a straight bat, uh, be a positive thinker. I see the glass half full. Um, and yeah. that, that's the way it's been for me. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, it's Matt Shorty on Times Radio in conversation with Giles Brandreth. In a moment, we're going to talk about what a ne- what a, your, your, another another project from Giles Brandreth. Uh, uh, it's a podcast, and he's 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 not mucking about. The first guest on the podcast is a member of the royal family. We'll find out who next. This is Matt Shorty on Times Radio, still talking to uh, Giles Brandreth, former Conservative MP, jumper enthusiast, poetry enthusiast, and podcaster. And Giles, we've already talked a bit about um, your your social appetite for working and doing new things. You're, I don't, I'm sure you don't mind me saying so. You're seven, seventy four. There aren't many seventy four year olds who are who are launching. A, how many podcasts did you do? You obviously do the one with Susie I do. Dent, I'm very which is lucky. Popular. Uh, two things to say to you, Matt. One is um, that my wife has just passed me a note saying I used to like Matt until he started banging on about your age. Two, uh, I was about to say. Uh, Giles, <laughs> remember it's supposed to be a conversation. Uh, do let him speak occasionally, um, <laughs> then I will let you speak. But you're right. I uh, have a podcast with Susie Dent, and it's we've been so lucky because Susie is a genius. It's about words and language. It's called Something Rhymes with Purple. We've won the award, yeah. best entertainment podcast. We've had literally tens of millions of downloads. It, it is it's very successful. We've done 150 episodes. If you want, to, if you cared about words and language and love language. Tune into this podcast. Uh, but I've got a new podcast. And this is something, one of the most exciting and interesting things to have happened to me in my life. Uh, I, a few years ago, because I got involved in something called the Queen's Commonwealth Essay Prize, which is the oldest school's essay writing competition in the world, something started by Queen Victoria a long time ago, even before my time. Uh, oh, yeah. It involves children from around yeah. the world sending in essays. And it's been going for, you know, a hundred and more years. And I was involved in helping present the prizes and sort of being the MC at the, at the finale. And as a result of this, it's run by the Royal Commonwealth Society. They said to me, will you be an ambassador for the Royal Commonwealth Society? I said, well, of course. I mean, I like the idea of the Commonwealth. Of course I do. Yeah. And then I stopped and thought, actually, what do I know about the Commonwealth? Oh, you know, I know the Queen loves the Commonwealth. I don't even know what countries are in the Commonwealth. And when I suddenly overheard somebody saying, you know, there are, of course, European countries in the Commonwealth. I thought, European countries in the Commonwealth? Uh, and the, the Commonwealth is growing. I thought, well, what's all this about? So I made inquiries. And it turns out there are 54 countries in the Commonwealth, possibly 55 if the Gabon uh, now joins, because it's one of the countries that wants to join the Commonwealth. Countries with no connection with the old yeah. British Empire are wanting to join the Commonwealth. Countries like Mozambique, Rwanda... Uh, the Gabon, joining the Commonwealth. And I discovered that, you know, the Commonwealth contains two and a half billion people, a third of the world's population. And I thought, oh, I want to visit the Commonwealth. And this was during lockdown. I thought, I'm never going to be able to get to visit. I can't leave the country. I can't leave my home. Never mind visit the Commonwealth. So I thought, uh, I was having a chat with my daughter, Afra, let's go on a virtual tour of the Commonwealth. So we have embarked on this tour of the Commonwealth. And we've called our podcast the Commonwealth Poetry Podcast because one of the things that is universal is poetry. I love poetry. I've always loved poetry. Silly poetry, short poetry, nonsense, deep poetry. Poetry I don't understand, like T.S. Eliot. Poetry I understand completely, like the limerick, there once was a man from Peru whose limerick stopped at line two. Every kind of poetry gives me pleasure. So I thought this is a good way maybe to meet somebody from another country, a Commonwealth country, wherever it is, the Cameroon, Nigeria, Ghana, and say to them, tell me about the poetry of your childhood and find out when they first got into words and language, usually through nursery rhymes and often through poetry. And then when you were older, what was the love poems? You ever come across those? And in your country now, tell us about your country now, what it's like, what people learn at school there, and what you eat during the day. Uh, And then... They choose one or two or three poems, either the ones they've written themselves, if they are poets themselves, or poetry from that country. And it's been a completely amazing... We've already recorded quite a few of them, but they're going to go out every fortnight over the next two years. And I needed to kick off somewhere. And I thought, well, the Royal Commonwealth Society, the Queen is the patron, and the vice patron is Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Cornwall. And I thought, well... Uh, Why don't I ask her? Because I knew already, because she very kindly and generously supports another poetry project of mine called Poetry Together, where we get older people, people in care homes often, and young people, school children, to learn a poem by heart, and then they get together around Poetry, National Poetry Day, and they have a tea party, a tea cake, and they do a poetry slam 
the old people and the young people. Last year we had a, an old soldier in his 90s from the Chelsea pensioners and a boy of 13 and they recited a Siegfried oh, yeah. Sassoon First World War poem together. It was so moving. Anyway, uh, she supported that in the past so I thought, I know she loves poetry. So I asked her and amazingly, she said, oh yeah, you're doing this with your daughter, come round. And we turned up at Karen's house. She said, who's going to read the poems? And I said, well, I'm doing Celebrity Gogglebox with Joanna Lumley. She said, well, bring her along. So I thought for Joanna, well, it'll make a change from Naked Attraction. Let's go along. <laughs> and uh, so I said to Joanna, uh, we're meeting uh, the Duchess of Cornwall at her home, apparently, in the garden room. Uh, we're invited, uh, you know, maybe coffee and biscuits and a bit of poetry. So Joanna said, well, I'm up for that. So my daughter and I turned up. And um, there was the Duchess. And I thought, I thought, where are the minders? Where are the people? Where are the scriptwriters? Where are the advisors? And there were none. So we just sat there with a couple. I brought with me a couple of students from the University of Chester because I'm the Chancellor of the University of Chester. And this is a pro bono project. Yeah. Nobody makes any money out of this. Nobody's being paid. Everyone is doing this for love. And because also it's a journey we're all going on. We're discovering these different Commonwealth countries. So anyway, they turned up with recording equipment. We sat down and there was the Duchess. And she, she genuinely knows and loves poetry and she knows and loves the Commonwealth. And so we were talking about Commonwealth countries she's been to, what she's learnt from them. And, of course, it's quite unusual to spend 40 minutes with royalty um, just chatting. And that's what I think why people will enjoy listening to this Commonwealth Poetry podcast is because it's so informal. It was more informal than we intended because she did say, as we got to the first poem, Where, where's, where's Joanna? And I said, well, um, I'm just going to text you. She's stuck on the bridge. And I said, she's not the Duchess of Cornwall or the Prince of Wales. She hasn't got police outriders. She's stuck on the bridge because uh, she lives south of the river. And, of course, they're north of the river. Um, anyway, so we thought, what are we going to do? So we, th we decided we'd have to read the poem together, my daughter, um, myself, and the Duchess. So we begin to read this poem. I think it's a W.H. Auden poem, Nightmare. got a lovely rhythm to it. Uh, when the door bursts open and in comes Joanna Lumley, now Dame Joanna Lumley. And we say, oh, thank God you're here. And we say, she sits down, so the four of us read the poem. And, and then the Duchess said, well, actually, isn't this interesting um, that we felt unconfident because we're not an actress like Joanna, the rest of us reading the poem, but doing it together, it was fun. And why don't we encourage people to share a poem, like a coffee morning? And, and so that's... So we're now wanting people yeah. all over the Commonwealth to have poetry slams. We launched this Commonwealth Poetry Podcast last Sunday, and you can tell when you launch a podcast who's listening and where they're listening. 77 countries have already downloaded this podcast. Wow. Nobody realises in this country, the UK, yeah. how powerful the Commonwealth is and how the soft power yeah. that the Queen the Platinum Queen has given us over these years with her authority and her decency, her integrity, her staying power. That has been such an invaluable asset to us. Whether you're, you know, whether you're a royalist or a Republican, you can't take that away. And so this is making an impact. And of course, the one at Clarence House will be very different from the next one, which comes from Rwanda. A, a country in the news for very different reasons, but the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting is taking place next week in, Ru in Rwanda. Prince Charles is going with uh, the Duchess of Cornwall, of course. Uh, the first time I think someone from the royal family's uh, been there. Um, th these are all ones you've recorded remotely, are they? No, you, you've not been uh, able to make you, it to Rwanda I want to go, yourself. I'd love to go to Rwanda, and I hope I, I, I hope I will one day get there. The country I'm most I wanted to go to Mozambique. I want to discover in Mozambique, why they wanted to join the Commonwealth. What's interesting about the Commonwealth is that it's these yeah. the disparity between the size and, and impact of the countries. Australia, huge country. Uh, India, vast country. And then you have uh, Tuvalu, small countries. It's something like 12,000 people. You have these uh, Pacific islands that may be Commonwealth countries that could disappear as the sea rises. And yet, at Chogham, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, all these people have equal standing. And that's why they love being part of it. It's an international organisation of independent, free countries. And they are, that it's like a family. And, I mean, it's a great privilege, in a sense, for us that the Queen is the head of the Commonwealth. And already we know that the Prince of Wales, uh, when eventually he succeeds the Queen, will be the next head of the Commonwealth. It, it is, it's fantastic. 
Um, so it's it's and the idea of the podcast in the, or future episodes we begin with a kind of just a minute where we try and encapsulate what the country is in a minute can hardly be done but you know main products etc so we hope um school yeah. children and students will listen as well as people who love poetry yeah get a sense of the, the of the place as well yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a fascinating thing, and 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 it's so, so well timed ahead of uh, ahead of Chogham, um happening next week. Before we um before we finish up, two thoughts occur to me. Why is it sitting in that room, Duchess of Cornwall, Dame Joanna Lumley? Give her everything you've please, done. Don't be embarrassing. Why is it not Sir move, Giles Brandon? Move on. Move on. Uh, yeah, that's yes. And next question. This one, but well, the campaign the campaign starts here. We'll do that. Um, the final final question. Having started with what what is it you wanted to be when you were a young boy? Now that you're a young man, um, what what would you really like to have a go well, it's at wonderful that you haven't to... yet been able to? Can try? I say I am? I think the most blessed Olympic. person in the world. I've got a bucket list, and on the bucket list is I've in, it's included many things over the years. I wanted to fly Concorde the aeroplane Concorde, and I found myself on Concorde, uh, and we were about to land in New York, and the pilot called me to the front of the plane and said, I, I've heard that you wanted to fly Concorde. Would you like to land Concorde in New York? So I'm somebody who has been given so wow. many blessings. Last year, I milked a cow for the first time, and wait for it, tomorrow, Saturday, I am at Royal Ascot wearing my proper bib and tucker and top hat and i am presenting the trophy of course to the winner of the 325 race i will be there in the royal enclosure presenting the cup to whoever wins the hardwick sakes at 325 i mean you know you name the dream and i'm alive and then on sunday i mean when i was in in, it's beyond belief when i was a little boy the first time i saw shakespeare play was romeo and juliet uh, at the Old Vic, 1960, directed by Franco Zeffirelli, the young John Stride as Romeo, and the very, very young Judy Dench as Juliet. And I sat there thinking, my dream is to be on stage with Judy Dench. That was in 1960. Well, there's hope for us all, because here we are in 2022, and that dream for me comes true. So the answer to this is, wait long enough. And remember... You began by asking me what my ambition was when I was a little boy, and I said, to be Prime Minister. Well, I'm several years younger than the President of the United States. Anything can happen. <laughs> and if there's one thing we know about British politics, and indeed your career, Giles, it's that anything can happen. Uh, Giles, Brad, it's been so lovely to talk to you. Uh, we, it could have gone on and on to make it a feature. Giles, thank you so much for joining us on Times Radio. And a and reminder, the podcast the is called podcast the Commonwealth is Poetry Podcast. Wherever you get your podcast. And it's also, there's a website online and you can communicate with us and send in Commonwealth Poetry that you would like us to consider. So it's a, it's a two-way story, totally pro bono. And that's a Latin phrase meaning for good. And we can keep Latin phrases in our language, in my view. I'm the person who for many years thought in loco parentis meant my dad's an engine driver. But then... <laughs> 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 on that uh, silly note uh, Giles Madden we'll leave it there thanks so much for joining us bye there you go good good